into my parlor. I have books. What? That would have worked for me. Hi guys, it's Leanne and I am here today with a very relaxed little book haul. Well, I say it's a little book haul, it's not really a little book haul, but just go with me here. As you can see from the background, I am filming this whilst in the middle of redecorating my library. So I thought I would take five minutes to have a sit down, have a cup of tea, and take you on a little memory journey with me. So a couple of weeks ago, where three book lovers finally got their anticipated trip into the heart of Edinburgh bookshopping together. It was us, by the way. It was me and Jean and Ashley. Also, is this picture not just the most tell me that you live in Scotland without telling me that you live in Scotland picture? If you guys follow Ashley's channel, then you will probably know that she recently moved to Edinburgh. It made Jean and I very happy and we have decided to take all credit for forcing Ashley to move to Scotland. Naturally, we decided that it was time for a celebration. Those of you who have been around my channel for a little while will know that during all of the lockdowns, me and lovely wife Helen were shielding. For 15 entire months we literally had two visits from my mum in between two of the lockdowns and maybe like four hugs with any other human beings. And I think it's fair to say that by the end of all of this my mental health was a little bit in the toilet and I was very anxious about going back outside. Very, very anxious. Despite the fact that both myself and Lovely Wife Helen have had both of our vaccines we're still incredibly wary. I had definitely lost my confidence a little bit, but this trip was genuinely one of the nicest experiences I've ever had book shopping. Jean and Ashley are honestly two of my best friends and I feel like super fortunate to have them. They were so patient with me. Get you some friends who are willing to stop with you halfway up a very, very steep and very sunny Edinburgh hill so that you can wheeze into your inhaler for a while. That chronic illness life, yo. The first stop on our bookstore crawl was to Toppings & Co, which, oh, it's just one of the most beautiful buildings ever. I love it so much. I don't think any of us have ever wanted to live in a bookstore as much as we wanted to live in toppings <laughs> as evidenced by, you know, Jean looking like the landlord there for the rent, Ashley looking like a fairy princess on the ladders, and me creepily trying to claim the entire thriller section at once. I got two books and toppings because we were all very, this is the first bookshop, we've seen a lot of things that we want, but you know, there's many places to go, we don't want to carry too much. <laughs> Mm. Needless to say that by the end of it we all had marks in our wrists from the bags. The first book that I picked up was Antigone Rising by Helen Morales. Toppings put all of their hardbacks in these protective sleeves so that the hardback doesn't get damaged and I just, oh, the actual service. Never fear, Toppings is here to preserve all of your dust jackets and French flaps. One of the things that I wished that I had done more during my literature degree was look at ancient literature, was look at classical literature and thanks to having, you know, Jean in my life, I at least have some very good recommendations for where to go to get started. Antigone is by far my favourite classical text. I did so much writing on it, as much writing as I possibly could at the time. And so it didn't take very much persuasion for this one to end up in my bag. This one is subtitled The Subversive Power of Ancient Myths. It says, the idealised portrayal of ancient Greece that most of us learned in school glosses over the brutal misogynies of antiquity and their toxic legacy today. But for each story of violence against women, there's another that tells of female solidarity and empowerment, and it's time we reclaimed them. So each chapter in this looks at a famous Greek myth and then re-centres the women in it where, you know, they should have been in the first place. I read a couple of pages of this while we were wandering around the store and it is very accessible and very conversational, so I'm really really excited. The other thing that I bought in toppings is also technically Jean's fault because she introduced us to wooden books and Ashley and I both picked up one or two. They're not actually made of wood, that's what the publisher is called. There are these tiny little informational books on lots of different topics. I don't know if you can see but the font of it is a holographic and everything in here 
looks like an old wood carving. It's just very sexy, it's very sexy. And in addition to being informational, this will also end up being a piece of decor in my newly renovated library. It's like the dinkiest coffee table book that you ever did see. After toppings, we took a scenic wander in the sunshine to Blackwell's. I am a massive fan of Blackwell's bookshop. I think that every town should have one, especially because the basements of Blackwell's tend to just be board game dens. And Jean and I did spend a slightly excessive amount of time pawing through the board games while Ashley looked at, you know, books. I don't think I've ever seen Ashley walk so fast away from us. So Blackwell's often do a three for two on their books and we decided that we were going to do a little round robin with our three for two where we're going to get two books for ourselves and then one book for somebody else. Because we like organised fun in our little group we literally drew straws and I ended up buying a book for Ashley. The book that I got for Ashley was Ace of Spades because she was very very much anticipating it and I felt like that was a fairly sure deal being as Ashley Ashley and I's fantasy tastes meet in the middle along with a few other really random things and then we have massive outlying sections that just don't cross over at all. On the other hand however Jean was very excited to have got me because she immediately spotted a thriller that she had read that I had not read, whereby she proceeded to parade around the entire bookshop with it in a very smug fashion. Which is, you know, fair, because usually I'm shoving thrillers into Jean's bag. The one that she picked up for me was House of Correction by Nikki Fridge, and I have purposefully not even read the back of it so we could find out together what it's about. Nikki Fridge is one of those authors that I've always considered picking up, but because her main series is a detective series, which is something that I really don't read anymore, I've kind of just delayed dipping my toe in and now I don't even have to make the choice because it's in my hand. Okay so the tagline says she's a murderer. Points for her already. Everyone knows she killed Stuart Rees. Why else would his body be found in her garden shed? Now Tabitha is in prison awaiting trial. Oh I love it when the story is told backwards when it's told after the crime has happened and after you know justice has happened and then we're unpicking what really occurred. That's one of my favourite tropes Jean has picked well. That day is such a blur. She can't remember clearly what happened but one thing is certain she is not capable of murder and there is only one person she can count on to get her out of this. Herself. Yes, girl's got to do it for herself. So Tabitha must fight against all the odds stacked against her for her life. Ooh, this is definitely in my wheelhouse. This is long for a thriller too. How long is this? It's like 500 pages. That is quite a chunky thriller. I am intrigued. Maybe I should pop this in my Jean Made Me Read It vlog. What do you guys think? So for the rest of my three for two, I was immediately drawn to two books in particular. One of the books I spotted while actually sitting down to take a breather and it was like right in front of me and I was all, mmm, what is that? And the other book is a book that I've seen several times before but have never picked up. The first one is a thriller, predictably for me, and it's A Crooked Tree by Una Mannion. This was the cover that I saw and I was like, I must know. And Faber and Faber have blown it out of the park with this particular blurb because after I read it, I just immediately put it in my hand. Rage. That's the feeling engulfing the car as Ellen's mother swerves over to the hard shoulder and orders her daughter out onto the roadside. Ignoring the protests of her other children, she accelerates away, leaving Ellen standing on the gravel verge in her school pinafore and knee socks as the light fades. This moment is the beginning of a summer that will change everything. I mean, does it not just make you want to pause the video and go buy it and read it? I mean, it might make you want to do that, but don't actually do that. Just, you know, write it down because there are a few more here that you might want to buy too. The other one that I spotted was On Chapel Sands by Laura Cumming. This one was one that I saw on Waterstones and, you know, every other bookseller's website for the past year and I just can't get away from it. It keeps following me. Apparently it was shortlisted for the 2019 Costa Biography Award, which I also didn't know was a thing, but now feel that I need to look into further. One of the things that I've discovered that I've taken a real liking to over the last couple of years is childhood memoirs where there's some kind of mystery involved. And on Chapel Sands follows in those footsteps. So this is about Laura Cummings' mother, who in 1929 
was abducted from a seaside beach. She was gone for five days and then she was discovered completely safe, absolutely well in herself in a neighbouring village. But that event was never talked about again in Laura's family. The entire family just swept everything under the rug and pretended that it didn't happen. But Laura felt the echoes of it all the way through to her present day and felt like it was finally time to do some digging. The first line of it really got me. It says, this is how it began and how it would end on the long pale strand of Lincolnshire beach in the last hour of sun the daylight moon small as a kite in the sky. The thing is, by the time when we got to Blackwells, I had finally started to feel a little bit comfortable. And I think something in my body had realized that I was finally in a place where I was allowed to buy books. Like I could actually touch physical books on a shelf and choose the ones that I wanted to take home with me. And so I ended up with another two books that just called to me. I decided to have a guilt-free book buying day and we all deserve one of them every now and again. So the next one that I picked up was The Firekeeper's Daughter by Angeline Bully. This is a YA thriller and this was actually recommended to me by one of my absolute besties, my partner in crime, Kirsty. I'll link Kirsty's bookstagram account down below so that you can go and see her beautiful feed. She read this and she immediately came to me and was like, this is one that you'd like and I have literally never taken a Kirsty recommendation that I did not enjoy. This is about Donnie. She lives on a Native American Indian reservation in America and she feels like her mixed heritage has always meant that she has one foot on the reservation and one foot in small downtown America and that she doesn't fit in either of those places because of the way that she looks. Then one day Donnie witnesses a horrendous murder and much to her surprise is dragged in by the FBI and is begged to be part of an undercover operation. Drugs have long been filtering their way onto the reservation and the FBI is desperate to get Donnie's help to try and find the source. Donnie is understandably absolutely terrified and doesn't want to do this but she realises that this might be a way for her to prove that she is really part of her community by doing the very most to protect them. Last up, I picked up one of the most beautiful books that I have seen in a while. This is Mrs. England. It is by Stacey Halls, who also wrote The Foundling, which is another absolutely stunning cover that I've seen for a while, but for some reason, just never made me want to pick it up. The blurb on this one just doesn't quite sound like my thing. So I was delighted to discover when this one sounded absolutely right up my alley. Although Bonnier and other publishers, can you sort your shit out please? Why would you make such a beautiful cover like this and then have a non-removable sticker of another cover on it? Just there's all this stunning elegance. And then there's these creepy matching end paper sets. And then the non-removable sticker on the front. Can you can you not, please? Can we not? Anyway, <clears throat> this one is about Ruby. It is West Yorkshire. It is 1904, and Ruby takes up a position in Hardcastle House as a newly qualified nurse there to look after the two small children. This is a fresh start for her. She gets to leave everything that she's gone through behind and become a new person but when she gets there things in the house are just a little bit strange. The mother who was described as a complete angel of the house actually is very rarely present and really doesn't care at all about her children. The father is a little bit over solicitous and none of the servants want to talk to her. As all of these weird little puzzle pieces start sliding into place for Ruby and she gets more and more anxious about her position, her sister stops writing completely with letters from home. There's no news at all outside of the Hardcastle house and Ruby then realises that actually she may have walked into something a lot bigger than she thought and quite possibly she might never walk out again. We then went on a wander which took us past a witchy bookshop which we all picked up something in and then we went to Transreal which is a very small 
science fiction and fantasy specialist bookshop and I didn't pick up anything there because I really feel like I have enough fantasy series in my life right now and that's the thing that you want to go to Transrail for. You want to go there for all of the tiny mass market paperbacks. Needless to say, Jean was absolutely in her elements. But then we had to admit defeat after a lot of wandering in and out of some pretty shops and getting lunch and things. All of our feet had had enough and so we made our last stop Waterstones. I haven't been in a Waterstones in a really long time and I find that a lot of the time when I walk into Waterstones on a regular basis when it's not pepperoni times that I don't often pick up a lot unless I've gone there for a specific item. As Jean pointed out I find a lot of the time Waterstones stock doesn't really rotate so I don't often find new surprises in there but I hadn't been anywhere in 15 months and so there were quite a few books on the shelves that I just, I just somehow ended up in my hands. Like this many of them ended up in my hands. I will say however, two of them are absolutely the fault of a really lovely bookseller who caught me right at the end of my trawling because they were very excited to see that I had picked up a copy of a book that they had loved and we got chatting and that very bookseller book lover thing happened where I was just like oh go on then. So two in here are entirely that bookseller's fault but I have started one of them already and it's really really fun so I think they were probably really good picks. The first thing that I picked up was a horror that I had never seen before. This is Such Pretty Things by Lisa Heathfield. It is about two small children who, following their mother's accident, go to stay with their aunt. Their aunt has been waiting for them and for a family for a really, really long time and when they get there she's so welcoming, she can't wait to make a proper family. She brushes their hair, she makes them clothes, she lets them explore the woods just outside of her house. But the longer that Clara is there, the more that she thinks that her aunt is hiding something and she starts to explore more than just the woods. She starts to explore the house and her aunt's past. And then the two of them get locked into this deadly little game of control wherein Clara knows that something is changing her little brother and she doesn't think she's going to be in time to stop it. It has creepy dolls on the front. I don't even care if it ends up being trash. I just want to read it. The next thing that I picked up was predictably another thriller. This is, oh, <laughs> this is a post-it note from that very same bookseller who gave me extra recommendations at the till, so I'll look into them later. This is Girl 11 by Amy Souter Clark, and it is based on another podcast. So of course true crime podcasts have really had a rise in the last couple of years. There are so many of them. I love them dearly. I think I've listened to you know everyone in existence by this point and I do of course recommend Sadie as I mentioned earlier on which is based on a true crime podcast and this one is kind of in a similar format. So it says on the front a podcaster seeking answers a killer lying in wait. True crime podcaster El Castillo has long been obsessed with the countdown killer. Victims. 20 years ago he went on a killing spree. Each new victim was a year younger than the last. Vengeance. Now he's back. Elle must stop the deadly countdown before the killer can claim the next victim. Now I'm not gonna lie, that on its own probably wouldn't have got me to pick it up even with my obsession with true crime podcasts because I'm a little bit over the serial killer narrative but when I picked it up I discovered that half of it is written in the true crime podcast episodes and a bunch of it is written in actual interview format and I really enjoy that. So I'm excited but also a little bit trepidatious about this one because I feel like it could go a wrong way but I'm hopeful that it will go all the right ways. The last one that I picked up under my own steam completely was Wendy Darling by AC Wise. You guys know that I am trash for Peter Pan. I did a lot of work on Peter Pan when I was studying literature and all of the really like twisted J.M. Barry parts of Peter Pan, all of the parts of Peter Pan that we never ever talk about. Very much marketed as this like wholesome children's fairy tale of this boy who didn't want to grow up and it's so very much more than that. It's 
so very screwed up. So I love a Peter Pan retelling which looks into the really dark bits of Neverland and this is definitely one of them. This is about Wendy Darling who grew up, she's now an adult, she's now married, she has her own home and she has a young daughter. But one day she's coming up to her daughter's bedroom and she discovers Peter sitting in her daughter's bedroom window. Peter who went back to Neverland and who decided that he was never going to grow up and before she gets there, before she can possibly stop anything from happening, Peter takes her daughter from her bedroom and takes her off to Neverland. And Wendy realises that she has no choice but to go after them and to save her daughter and to really confront the dark heart of Neverland. And it kind of sounds like a thriller mixed with Peter Pan and I'm very there for all of those things. And now for the two that the bookseller persuaded into my hands. I had passed this one on a table a couple of times and I finally circled back to it and picked it up and that is when they pounced. So I think they knew that like, you know, deep down I really wanted to take it with me. And as you can see, I already have a bookmark in it and it's kind of hilarious. This is Lockdown Abbey by Beth Cowan Erskine. And it's kind of like a Downton Abbey spoof, but make it mid 1930s, but make it Scotland, but make it during a pandemic of their own, but make it Agatha Christie. That's pretty much exactly what this book is. I can't not read you the synopsis for this one because it's too funny and I, uh, very clever. It's genuinely very clever. It's the 1930s and a mysterious illness is spreading over Scotland. Mm. But the noble and ancient family of Inverkillen, residents of Lockdown Abbey, are much more concerned with dwindling lavatory paper and supplies and who will look after the children now that Nanny has regretfully and most inconveniently departed this life. Then Lord Inverkillen, Earl and heir of the family, is found dead in mysterious circumstances. The inspector declares it an accident, but Mrs. McBain, the head housekeeper, isn't convinced. As no one is allowed in or out because of the illness, the residents of the house, both upstairs and downstairs, are the only suspects. <laughs> How many of us could have genuinely done this kind of like lockdown Cluedo mystery in our own houses being stuck with people? With the Earl's own family too busy doing what can only be described as nothing. She decides to do some digging, in between chores of course, and in doing so uncovers the whole host of long hidden secrets, lies and betrayals that will alter the dynamics of the household forever. And then the last one that I picked up was People of Abandoned Character by Claire Whitfield. Now this one was one that I read the back of, at least the start of it, and I was super, super excited about it. In fact, I shoved it into Jean's hands before I had finished reading the blurb, and then I got to the end of it and I was like, oh no. And I don't know about you guys, but the Jack the Ripper stuff is one of those things that I hear and both half of me becomes absolutely infuriated because why are we still talking about the killer and not the victims? And the other half of me just goes, oh, another one. But I had been so intrigued by the start of this blurb and by the first couple of pages that when the bookseller, after, you know, talking to me about what I liked and what we'd read recently and stuff, drew me back to this one, I just couldn't say no. So I'm telling you about it with a little bit of reservation because especially after having read something like The Five by Hallie Rubenhold, which of course looks into the victims of the Jack the Ripper Whitechapel murders. And you know, and having taken a step back from any kind of narrative that doesn't focus the victims, I am kind of dubious. Again, I'll read you the blurb because it was the thing that drew me in and maybe you will see where my interest was piqued. It says, London 1888. Susanna rushes into marriage with a young and wealthy surgeon. After a passionate honeymoon, she returns home with her new husband wrapped around her little finger. But then everything changes. His behaviour becomes increasingly violent and volatile. He stays out all night turning home bloodied and full of secrets. Lonely and frustrated, Susanna starts following the gruesome reports of a spate of murders in Whitechapel. But as the killings continue, her mind takes her down the darkest path imaginable. Every time he stays out late, another victim is found dead. Is it coincidence or is her husband the man the papers call Jack the Ripper? But the bookseller assures me, and skip forward like a minute if you don't want any spoilers at all, 
that this is actually much less about the Jack the Ripper cases and it is far more about the descent into this person being completely trapped and cut off from the world and coming up with things in her own head. I asked for quite an explicit spoiler and I don't want to tell you any explicit spoilers so I will say that this gives me vibes of The Upstairs Room by Kate Murray Brown where it's one of those like are there supernatural forces in the house or is the wife descending into a kind of psychosis and if she is is that to do with the house or is that nothing to do with the house and just circumstantial. So yes I have question marks about this one but I am fascinated and I am looking forward to giving it a try. So yes that was my Edinburgh bookshop crawl. I feel very blessed to have the sweetest, most loving friends in the world. Don't get me wrong, we also spent the entire day giving each other shit. As is traditional, naturally. My tea is finished. Here are all the books. You're welcome. Goodbye, book buying ban. Definitely more on that in a future video. I hope you enjoyed coming out with us on our little day out. Don't worry, there will be more in the future. I will take you along. As always, please tell me, have you read any of these books? Are you interested in any of these books? Did my bookseller in Waterstones sell you any of these books like me? Please tell me all about it down in the comment section. If you are new here, please consider subscribing for more book hauls that are usually about the same size as this, let's be perfectly honest. And if you enjoyed this video, please consider whacking the thumbs up button so that other people can maybe find it and enjoy it too. And I will speak to you all soon, guys. Bye! Thank you.